switch uh, to the next talk, Anthony. <laughs> yes. From Norway, uh, University of Oslo. Okay, so Morgan, you have to stop sharing because I can. Uh, great. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Ah, sorry about that. Here, okay. Okay, so uh, thanks very much for the organizers for inviting me. It's a really, really nice workshop. I'm, I'm really pleased to have been invited and to participate and uh, and for the opportunity to present some of the work that we've uh, developed uh, recently in the in the lab. So it's also a nice thank you, Francois and, and Morgan, for a, a lot of the introduction. So I, I won't have to introduce too much uh, on, on, the, on the topic, obviously. Uh, but what I would like to focus on today is more trying to see how we can use this GIPSIC uh, data and uh, position weight matrix or all the type, any type actually uh, of models uh, that are modeling transcription factor binding site to predict with uh, high accuracy, as much as we can, direct TFDN interactions that uh, we believe are, are very important functionally, right, to drive uh, transcriptional regulation. So, I mean, it's very obvious to this, to this crowd, transcription factors are uh, the center of the universe uh, uh, that uh, they're involved in uh, regulation of transcription uh, by binding specifically really at uh, regulatory regions, promoters and enhancers, uh, insulators and so on. And one very important uh, task uh, in, 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 in the field is really to be able to identify these uh, particular locations in the genome where a TF is interacting with the DNA uh, in order to regulate transcriptional regulation and then to better understand the, the underlying molecular mechanisms behind transcriptional regulation and how, also how this mechanism can be disrupted in disease. So that's, that's, that's the goal, right? That's the plan. So we want to know where your transcription factor is uh, bound to the DNA. So classically, it's been um, uh, pointed out in the previous talks, uh, what do we do when you want to define in vivo where TF is interacting with the DNA? You do chip seek. So, uh, I mean, most of you must be familiar with that, but you're interested in knowing basically where this particular uh, protein here, the blue protein, uh, is interacting with the DNA. So you cross-link and share your DNA, then you immunoprecipitate with an antibody that specifically recognizes uh, this uh, particular protein here, and then you purify your DNA sequence, you do a DNA sequencing, and then you map out back onto the genome, and you get uh, the so-called chipsic peaks that can get uh, analyzed, for instance, by RSAT uh, peak motif, right? So one uh, characteristic uh, of these uh, peaks, as Morgan pointed out, is that there are a few hundred base pair long, right? So the resolution is not really to the TF-DNA interaction uh, level, where we know that TFs interact with the DNA uh, through like 6, 10, 15 sometimes base pair. But here you have hundreds, 200, 300 um, uh, regions that are supposedly bound by a transcription factor of interest. And that's basically where a lot, unfortunately, where a lot of uh, people stop when they are uh, wondering where their TF is interacting with the DNA, and then they do a lot of uh, post-processing analysis to know what are the genes that are regulated and so on. But I think that one really key point that I want to highlight here is that you should not rely so much on ChIP-seq data without doing a lot of QC. Uh, for instance, it's been recurrently shown in the field that you do not always chip what you expect, right? Uh, so there are these uh, phantom peaks uh, that have been pointed out where basically whatever the TF that you chip, even if you knock down the TF and still chip the TF, you will see some peaks. Uh, you use the same peak color, the same parameters, and you will see the peaks coming over and over and over and over again. So uh, this is uh, quite a problem, right? Uh, and you have also a lot of motifs that are recurrently found um, in uh, the, the peaks of a lot of ChIP-seq experiments. For instance, um, uh, Rebecca Worsley Hunt and Wyeth Wasserman showed that if you look at ENCODE ChIP-seq experiments, you see that in more than 60% of the data sets, you have an enrichment, very strong enrichment of CTCF um, motif. And you have what they call here these zingers, so these unexpected things that are happening, where you have these motifs that come up over and over again. And when you intersect those uh, locations where you have identified these motifs with the actual chip seek for these um, uh, TFs, you see that it's very likely um, driven by the binding of these transcription factors, so which are not the, the TFs that, you, that you've chipped. So there is a little bit of noise or artifacts here that we are not uh, fully uh, understanding. But it's also something really to keep in mind that 
really not what uh, everything that you uh, get as peaks might be relevant for the TF uh, you are interested in. And here is a, a decomposition that uh, they put in their paper where you have here uh, one uh, 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 pipe plot, sorry, that represent one data set, and you have here the proportion of the Zynga motifs, so the peaks that contain Zynga motifs, the peak in, bl in black that contain the expected binding site, so the expected motif, the cheap TF motif, and then the rest that is unknown. And you see that it's very highly variable where you have a lot of noise, potentially noise, and some data sets where it's really more, uh, more clean, more pure in a way, where it's really uh, enriched for the motif that you're expected to be recognized by your by your TF. So, you know, there are a, a few limitations, I think, to ChipSeq that people really have to keep in mind uh, when they're uh, doing ChipSeq and analyzing ChipSeq. One of them, of course, is the resolution. So here you have regions that are supposedly bound by a transcription factor of interest, and you do not get uh, to um, the base pair resolution of transcription factor binding sites, about 10 nucleotide, nucleotides. And then you have some noise on some artifacts, uh, you, you, for instance, uh, it's highly dependent on the peak color parameters, right? Depending on the uh, threshold that you put uh, on the FDR, on the size uh, of um, distance to the reason, blah, 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 then you get from hundreds to tens of uh, thousands of, of peaks. Uh, you have all these phantom peaks. You have also non-specific binding of your transcription factor that is scanning the DNA. Uh, you have also the problem of the antibody quality. And you also have direct binding from the TF, indirect binding through another protein. Uh, so all of that is all mixed up in, in what big bag, basically, when you do your chip uh, experiment. And so it's really something to keep in mind. And uh, what we tried to do, basically, is trying to to do a little bit of cleaning in a way in these uh, data sets and try to identify basically what are really uh, the regions uh, that correspond to transcription factor binding sites with which we have, uh, for which we have um, a high level of um, um, uh, evidence basically. So for that, we uh, combine this ChIP-seq information with computational uh, models. Uh, so here I highlight position weight matrices, so I don't need to introduce uh, them to this crowd, and they've been introduced before in the previous talk. And we rely uh, more specifically in the Jasper database, which is a database that we are continuing updating that was uh, created back uh, in 2004 uh, when Wyeth Wasserman um, was at the Karolinska Institute with Albin Sendelin as the lead author and with also Boris Lenhart, uh, where basically they uh, compile information looking really going to the library at the time the, uh, and really reading the, the papers uh, on paper and extracting the transcription factor buying sites summarizing them for the for the TFs and and now of course with the explosion of next generation sequencing we have a lot of uh, new motifs that are generated uh, and that we manually curate uh, and we provide uh, open access to the community and I must say that most of the of the uh, motifs that we incorporate now derived from NGS and ChIPSEQ are are, uh, obtained from our sat so it's uh, really really useful so we have now this collection of models uh, that um, basically summarize the binding preferences for uh, transcription factors of interest and we also have access to these chip uh, experiments so we thought about combining both of them to be able to pinpoint what are uh, the likely uh, direct TF DNA interactions in vivo so for that, the idea is very simple, uh, and uh, you start from your uh, ChIP-seq experiment, you have your peaks that are summarized here with this um, region here, and then we take one PWM that corresponds to the PWM associated to the TF that has been chipped, and then what you first do is scanning the region. So you locate uh, the first position and you look at the TF emotive uh, similarity or the PWM score, whatever you want to call it. And you record that, then you, you slide uh, one by one nucleotide uh, the PWM along their sequence and you record at every position uh, the motif similarity. And at the end, you just keep uh, track of the position that corresponds uh, to the highest uh, PWM score. So the region computationally that is the most likely to be recognized, to be bound by your transcription factor of interest. And what we record as well is the distance to the peak summit. As Morgan said, we expect that there is an enrichment close to the, to the center, to close to the peak summit, because this is where we have the highest amount of experimental evidence that your TF is binding uh, onto the DNA, right? This is where the highest amount of reads are aligning. 
So you expect that. So we, when we do that uh, on uh, a given ChIP-seq experiment, this is the type of plot that we can um, have. So this is a scatter plot that summarizes uh, here all of these results. So you have one point here that corresponds to the TFBS location. So this particular instance here within one peak. Okay. So you have one point that is the best hit in a way in uh, one uh, peak. And so if you have 10,000 uh, peaks, you have, will have 10,000 points. And you record for each one of these hits, that is the best per peak, what is the, its distance to the peak summit, so the peak maxima, and what is the motif score. The higher, the better, because uh, the closer it is to the expected motif bound by your transcription factor. And what you see most of the time, and what is kind of expected, is this enrichment zone here, where you have a lot of sites that are enriched here with close distance to the peak summit and high motif score. And we believe that these should represent a direct binding of the transcription factor to the DNA through the recognition of its canonical motif. So we have here in this region both experimental through ChIP-seq and the, and the peak summit and computational uh, with the PWMs, evidence of direct TFDNA interactions. And then you have all of the rest uh, that can be biologically uh, important, of course. I, we, we do not uh, say that it's not. For instance, indirect binding, your TF is not directly binding to the DNA, but through another partners, and that uh, is involved in specific function. But you have also a lot of other things, uh, unknown and specific binding uh, through Zinger motifs, uh, chromatin conformation, sticky regions, phantom regions, whatever you want to call them noise artifact, and so on. And discriminating uh, the biologically relevant ones from the rest is a bit tricky, so we really wanted to focus on these region, this region here, the enriched region, where uh, we believe there is uh, the highest amount of signal. So that's the goal, right? We have uh, such a plot, for instance, and we want to identify this enrichment zone. And what we wanted to do is to do that automatically, right? And if you are able to do that automatically, the cool things that you will get uh, which will be really data-driven, is what is the threshold that you need to use on the PWM, what's the PWM score threshold that you need to use to automatically define where you have this enrichment. And that gives you also an automated threshold on the distance to the peak summit that you need to use to identify this enrichment zone. And if we are able to do that automatically, then the cool thing is that you will be able to do that for every single ChIP-seq data set independently, and you will have every time the specific, the specific thresholds that are important for this particular ChIP-seq experiment. So you can have different uh, thresholds depending uh, on the experiment, even if it's from the same uh, transcription factor. So that's the goal. And what we did was uh, just reusing a very old algorithm uh, from 1985. Uh, I was, uh, <laughs> yeah, two at the time, uh, so uh, quite uh, old now, uh, where basically it was developed uh, for uh, denoising um, uh, images. So you have here a grayscale uh, image, black and white image, and you want to remove the noise in this image. And what the algorithm does is first uh, plotting the histogram of the uh, grayscale intensity of every single pixel in this uh, image. And what uh, it want to do is decompose basically the signal here from the noise. And what it does is actually quite simple. It tries to find what's the threshold that optimizes, uh, that obtains uh, the highest sum of the entropy of the two sub-distributions that you would get at this threshold. So you decompose the signal into two, you compute the entropy of the first distribution, the second distribution, and you try to find the threshold that optimizes, that maximizes the sum of the entropies. So very simple, and if you uh, are able to do that, you identify this threshold, and you can consider everything that is above as signal and everything that is below as noise. And when you do that, this is what you get. You keep only the signal and you denoise basically the image. So we thought, okay, this is quite similar to what we have here, right? We have a lot of signal that corresponds to uh, what we think is noise, and then there is the signal, and we want to eliminate the noise. So what if we were to use uh, the uh, histogram of the motif scores and identify then automatically the threshold on the motif score and then do the same for the distance to the peak maxima? And it works really quite nicely. So this is the type of result that we get uh, where you have here the scatter plot, as I showed before here, it's the same plot, but using a heat map to give you information about the number of points that you have uh, here uh, giving you the z-axis, basically. Uh, and, and then you have the, the, the histogram and the threshold that are automatically identified. And you see that this is 
the enrichment zone that is automatically identified by the algorithm, uh, really data-driven, no parameters, and so on. And so we published this uh, a couple of years ago now. Uh, the tool is available, uh, this Chipit uh, tool, and we first applied it uh, to uh, human uh, ChIP-seq experiments, about 2,000 ChIP-seq experiments for, for human to provide TFBSs here in this enrichment zone, we have what we think are TFBSs at, that are derived from direct TFDN interactions. So first, what we showed is that if you focus here on these uh, TFBSs, uh, on, these, uh, on the sites that are in this um, enrichment zone, and you compare, so it's here it's derived from in vivo, right, from ChIP-seq, and we look now at in vitro data as um, an a posteriori uh, validation, right? Uh, we look at the binding affinity of the sequences here that are within this enrichment zone, and we compare to the affinity that you get in vitro for the TF to the sequences that are outside of this enrichment zone. And what we see is that there is a shift, there is a higher affinity for the sequences that are found in this enrichment zone, where we didn't use sequence information, uh, except the, the, the motif similarity, but um, uh, we see that the uh, threshold keep gets you basically uh, what, what you expect. And if you compute the distribution of all the p-values, we see that there is a very strong difference. So we are in uh, the enrichment zone. We show that we are really enriching for uh, sequences that have a higher binding affinity through protein binding microarray data, which is an in vitro experiment. What we showed as well in the paper is that if you look at the peaks that are uh, containing these, uh, these uh, TFBSs, so if we look at the peaks that contain here the TFBSs in this enrichment zone, and we look at their p-value, so max2, we use max2 at the time to call uh, peaks, uh, and we have uh, then the p-value that is associated, so uh, the uh, lowest the p-value, or here it's minus log 10, so the higher this value, the higher uh, the confidence we have in a way in, in the peaks. And what we compared is the p-value of the peaks that contain TFBS in the enrichment zone versus the peaks that we predict not to contain direct TFDN interactions. And what we clearly see across all of the data sets is a very strong tendency for them to uh, have lower p-value. So we see that the peaks that contain these TFBSs have, are of likely higher quality, of high, higher confidence. We also show in the paper they are more reproducible uh, across um, um, across replicates, so really uh, giving us uh, information about the confidence that we can have for these transcription factor binding sites. And so uh, that was the first round of uh, applying ChIPIT. Now we've uh, applied uh, it uh, in uh, more than 10,000 ChIPSeq experiments. We put our data on all the ChIPSeq experiments from the, uh, that are publicly available that we can, for which we had peaks that were called from Remap and GTRD. And we applied ChIPIT, uh, an adapted version now, updated version uh, to nine species, uh, ChIPSeq data sets, sorry, from nine species. Uh, and we are predicting now automatically transcription factor binding sites in these nine species. And we provide all of that uh, available uh, to the community uh, through our Unibind database. You have the URL here. And the paper that described this um, update uh, has been out now uh, for the last 10 days, I think it went out, uh, at the end of June. So you can read the paper and, and you can get access to all of these data. So we have data for 841 TFs uh, in, in more than uh, 1,000 uh, cell lines and, and tissues. And all of that is, uh, can be interrogated through the website and through a REST API. And we provide genome browser and so on. But we wanted to make sure that really what we see here across all of these species makes sense and is bi biologically relevant. So we did a, a few quality checks in a way. So let me uh, walk you through uh, what, uh, what we've done here in this paper. So first, if we want to uh, highlight that these transcription factor binding sites are really biologically relevant, we expect that they would be conserved through evolution. That's, you know, what's functional is more likely to be conserved. So this is what we've looked at. So here you have in these two plots the uh, conservation of uh, the TFBSC stored in Unibind from human and mouse. And here you have different ways of computing um, conservation using the phylo P or FASCONS with different numbers of um, genomes that you align. And what we see here is that the closer you get to the TFBS, the higher the uh, evolution, the conservation, sorry. 
and we see a very sharp peak right at the TFBA. So it's really showing that we have a strong enrichment of conservation for the transcription factor binding sites. And if you were to uh, use, for instance, uh, in Jasper, we provide also TFBSC. So we basically take the genome and we take a PWM and we just scan the whole genome and predict transcription factor binding sites. And if you compare the level of conservation here, you have this tiny bump of conservation to uh, the conservation that we have with Unibind with a very strong difference. So Unibind TFBSC is really show sharp peak of evolutionary conservation. Uh, and, and, and it's way more than what we would obtain if you were just to scan uh, your genome with uh, PWMs. So it's really reassuring for us showing that the TFBSCs that are provided in Unibind are uh, more likely to be functional and are at least uh, evolutionarily conserved. What we did as well was uh, intersecting these binding sites with uh, cis regulatory elements. So we took a cis regulatory regions or candidate cis regulatory elements predicted by ENCODE here. This, that corresponds to this track here. You have the example around the LDR, LDLR sorry, gene. You have the conservation here. And here uh, you have uh, the ENCODE cis regulatory elements. And we see that these, um, these um, TFBSCs here that we predict in Unibind because we provide the UCSC genome browser tracks uh, for that are really well aligning. And we have also some statistical assessment of that uh, in the paper. And we show that there is a nice concordance between these uh, cis regulatory elements that are active in different cell types uh, and cell lines and the predictions uh, from uh, Unibind. What we show also, uh, which I found quite interesting, was we, we, we tried to look at uh, the association between transcription factor binding sites and the uh, composition of uh, binding uh, uh, at cis regulatory regions with the specificity of the enhancer activity. So we took enhancers that were um, uh, predicted using cap analysis of gene expression data from cage data from Phantom 5. And the nice thing is that uh, in human, they had a data set for, uh, I think it's 900 samples. So they were able to look at the specificity of the enhancer activity. And this is what is recorded here for each enhancer, uh, what's the cell type specificity. The higher uh, this value, the higher the specificity. So basically meaning that it's really specifically expressed in one cell type or one tissue or things like that. And, and, and then the lower, the more ubiquitously expressed or active is the enhancer. And on the x-axis here, we plot the number of transcription factors for which there is at least one binding site in the enhancer. And we did that also with a total number of binding sites. And we see an anti correlation. So we see that basically enhancers that are more specific, they tend to have less transcription factors that have binding sites that we store in Unibind in them, which makes sense, right? I mean, if you need to be expressing on, in a very small sum, uh, number of tissues, then you have a very specific uh, TF that might be driven, driving it. But if you want to be expressed ubiquitously in a lot of cell types, then having binding sites for a lot of TFs makes more sense. And this is exactly what we observe also with the Unibind TFBSs. What we can do also is uh, looking at co-binding uh, events uh, using Unibind TFBSs. So this is uh, what we've done here in this example. So we uh, basically took all of the ChIP-seq experiments that were derived from the MCF7 cell line, which is a breast cancer, uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cell line. And we just uh, computed the, um, the correlation of binding between uh, multiple data sets that we had for, uh, in uh, MCF7. And we see so first that uh, the data sets that correspond to the same TF cluster together, which makes a lot of sense, reproducibility, that's good. And what we see also is uh, that you have TFs that are co-occurring together. So here, GATA3, FOXA1, ESR1, and guess what? Those ones are really well known to combine, uh, to co-bind together uh, yeah, specifically at enhancers that get activated in estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. So really uh, highlighting that you can use this resource also to uh, pinpoint TFs that might be collaborating uh, in particular uh, tissues. And you have all, also uh, like June FOS that represent the AP1 binding obviously, and so on and so forth. Uh, sorry. And uh, finally, I want, I want to say that uh, we also provide an enrichment tool with, uh, with Unibind. Uh, where basically you come up with your uh, regions of interest as bed files, and we will compute enrichment for uh, all the transcription factor binding site data sets that we have in uh, Unibind. And here again, an example uh, for uh, breast cancer, uh, where we took uh, the uh, CPGs that were hypomethylated in estrogen receptor breast cancer, 
as for the receptor positive sorry, breast cancer. And we see the enrichment of FOXA1, GATA3, SR1, so the usual suspects, which is a good positive control, that are really enriched around these CPGs that we know are hypomethylated and that get activated uh, in, uh, in breast cancer through the activation of these uh, transcription factors. So we provide uh, this uh, tool through our web interface and also as an R package that you can, uh, that you can use. Okay, so all in all, uh, to summarize, we provide, uh, I think, one of the first really genome-wide map of direct TFDN interactions across multiple species, where we combine both experimental and computational evidence of binding, so really high quality, I believe, transcription factor binding sites that are lucky direct TFDN interactions. Uh, we show that they are, are, they are of high quality, corresponding to a high uh, binding affinity, evolutionarily conserved, so very likely functional, and that you can use them to really highlight different types of bio, to address different types of biological questions, looking at combined, combinatorial binding of transcription factors, uh, specificity of activation. We are using them also for looking at mutations in cancer that lie within transcription factor binding sites. And we provide all of this data uh, through to the community through our Unibind database following the same principle as we have for Jasper, making everything uh, as high quality as we can and available uh, to the community through web interface and also programmatic access through a REST API, providing everything as bed files and, and FASTA and uh, genome tracks and, and everything. And if you want to know more, as I said, we recently published uh, the paper uh, which was on BioArchive for a few months and which uh, is out uh, now uh, for 10 days in, uh, in a journal. And of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who actually did the work. Uh, so Marius uh, was uh, the first PhD in my group, and he, was, he is the one uh, behind the Chipit pipeline and the first iteration of Unibind. Uh, Raphael, uh, who is uh, now a PhD in the group, who has driven this uh, second release of Unibind, analyzing more than these 10,000 chipsick experiments, so he made the, the, sweat, the, the server sweat a lot. And we have Aziz and Paul who worked on the, on the web interface. Uh, Jaime was also very much involved in this project, and of course, all my group and uh, the, uh, collabor our collaborators and the funders for allowing us to do, to do the job. And with that, I will be happy to take any question. Thank you very much. Cannot hear you, Veronique. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, Pierre, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry, I will disconnect. Okay, so I think I can read myself, I guess, the question. Yes. Uh, there is a question in the chat from uh, Guillaume. Uh, in your experience, can Unibind rescue noisy chip seek experiments for example due to non optimal antibodies or unstudied TFs? Um, I guess it can. I mean, what we do is a lot of uh, QC. I didn't uh, explicitly uh, describe everything. So everything is in the paper. Uh, so there are some chipsick experiments that we cannot rescue at all. I mean, we don't see any enrichment whatsoever of any motif that is found uh, close to the peak center and so on. So in that case, we believe they are really of poor quality for whatever reason. But what's nice with, uh, with our approach, I think, is that you can also be a bit more lenient on the peak calling, and then you will be able to really highlight what's uh, in the enrichment zone and then denoise basically a bit uh, the, um, the experiment directly. I hope this answers your, your question. May I? May, may I ask okay, a question? So we, we, we. Sorry. <laughs> okay, Pierre or Charles, whatever. Uh, okay, my, my mic is on. So, I, I, so thanks, Anthony, for the for your talk. You know how fun of uh, Unibind we are. <laughs> uh, so I have a, a question, comment, though. Um, so basically, um, Unibind is uh, based on the existence of a PWM, a known PWM. Uh, and Francois, for instance, have shown that you, you can have binding in vitro or in vivo without any motif. Plus, we have some issues, like, for instance, with a one case study, which is SAL4, for instance, you do have a PWM in Jasper, though yeah, there, there, there are a couple of papers uh, that were that shown that SAL4 will bind 80 rich regions, like simple repeats. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you miss, a, I mean, you basically discard many, many, many peaks 
though they yeah. are significant, at least according to uh, Adrian Bird and, uh, and, their, and his colleagues. So how do you deal with this uh, biological information? Because And I, actually, I had the same kind of question for Morgan as well, because uh, she said she can mask the simple repeats looking at motifs, but maybe that's something that is relevant, actually, biologically, I mean. Yeah, I, I agree. I know where you're coming from, obviously. Um, this is a very difficult problem. I mean, in a lot of cases, uh, if you take chip -seek experiments, you will have these uh, motifs that show up that are, you know, repetitive motifs, uh, which in a lot of cases might not have any biological relevance. In some, they might, you know, but it, it would require a lot of post-analysis. Uh, and uh, what we wanted to do was really focus on what is the most likely to be, um, to be important and the most likely derived from direct DNA interaction. So of course, if we don't have the motive, then we would not be able to, to capture that. But uh, if one has a motive, then he can always run chip it on the data and, and, and predict what would be the potential binding site. And if you have a, rep, uh, a small repetition that you want to try on with that, and you see that there is a very strong enrichment that, core, uh, that is coherent with the, with the CHIP-seq experiment and with the, the, the reads, close, close similar uh, centrality with the peak summit, then you can use that as well. I mean, there is no, nothing uh, that uh, uh, restrain you for doing it. But, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the short answer is no, we, we just discard uh, all of that, obviously, and, uh, and, and that is something that would be, require a bit more work to really understand. Thanks. And we have a question from uh, Rafael Murad. Uh, how can we be sure that all these noisy motifs, noisy peaks, are not the result of indirect binding, uh, uh, both from protein protein interaction and long range chromatin contact? I mean, uh, the short answer is that we cannot be sure. Uh, but then, as I said, um, knowing what's coming from this indirect binding or from noise artifacts, from the peak color, from the antibody and so on, it's, it's a tricky problem. So we wanted to rely, I mean, what we, we, we did really, uh, we took um, arbitrarily uh, one way saying that we would prefer specificity over sensitivity. So really that's what we do with, with Unibind. And, and then you can always analyze the peaks, and that's something that we are planning to do, obviously, uh, and working on, uh, analyzing all of these peaks that do not uh, fall within this enrichment zone to try to understand what's going on. I mean, the idea is, of course, to look at what are the other motifs that might be enriched specifically in these other peaks, and that could correspond then to indirect binding through a specific partner and to automatically derive that information. And uh, long range community interactions, uh, that's also something that we are uh, currently investigating. Oh, okay, so we have a question from Etienne Blanchin, but I think uh, so. As he says, as he as he wrote, so it's a very general question. So <laughs> I don't know if uh, someone wants to answer. So <laughs> the point I think is uh, that you know the motif and you want to predict. Uh, which transcription yeah. factor? So that, that is all. So yeah, that is also something that we are working on. So right now we are developing a tool to find what is the co-binding partner of a TF given the anchor motif. And so we have these enriched motifs. And uh, I mean, if you don't have, uh, I mean, what we do basically is the first doing motif similarity uh, from using RSAT or, or anything like that uh, to, to look at uh, known motifs and then use also protein-protein interaction information uh, from string to try to uh, infer basically what is the most likely TF that is binding there and rely also on the DNA binding domain because we know that TFs with similar DNA, DNA binding domain should uh, uh, bind to similar motifs. So those are the things that we're using right now to, uh, to try to address this, but it's, uh, it's clearly an open question in the field. And of course, if you don't know, uh, for a whole DB, I mean, the big problem is for zinc fingers, obviously, because uh, they, they represent uh, more than half of the TFs, and there are a lot of, uh, of them for which we don't have any motifs. So for those ones knowing exactly what it's binding to, uh, it will be very difficult. But I know that some people, uh, UC Taipei and uh, Team Hughes and so on are trying, and Bart Planck are trying now to uh, generate uh, data for every single TF in human to have a motif. So that will be really useful, I think, in the future. 
Ouais, je, je, je pense qu'il faut qu'on passe euh, au prochain talk, <rire> parce que là, euh, euh, on, on, a, on accumule <rire> du retard. <Désolé. rire> Mais euh, merci beaucoup, Anthony. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, en principe, on avait un break. <rire> Mais comme disait Pierre, peut-être on va le faire sauter. Ben là, je crois que oui. Moi, je ne sais pas ce que vous en pensez pour ne pas finir trop tard. Euh, il reste deux talks, donc euh, ça va. Et pour permettre...